much of your time. There were two starches out on the uh, two starches out there on the table, and then a lot of rolls. And I don't know about you, but if I eat starches, and if I eat rolls, I just get real snoozy. And um, the only t- the only time it's worse to preach. Uh, you know, you, I, I hate to preach right before lunch when people are hungry. But then after lunch, I mean, I'm feeling, a, I'm feeling a siesta spirit coming on the house right now. But it's good to be here, and thank you. And what a great group. What a great group. And I applaud you at whatever level and whatever area you are in pursuing your ministry. Um, I want to encourage you that the best messages have not yet been preached. The greatest preachers have not yet been recognized in our midst. The most effective soul winners, I just told you about this one young man in our church, and, and when he comes to me and he gets less than 30 Bible studies on a weekend, he's so down on himself. And I, I just want to say, really? I mean, but I... I, I, I I recognize he feels like he's living beneath his potential. So I'll get a stern look on my face and say, next time, you need to pray more. You need to ask God to lead you. And he walks away, and I'm thinking, 30? He only got 30? Um, But he's, he's, and I'm watching, I'm watching a generation that's a lot more sold out than my generation was. And uh, I'm so optimistic about the future. And I, I could talk to you about many, many things. But if I could mention one thing here today, I want to talk to you about a dream. About a dream to be used of God. Because I believe that that dream is more powerful than any force of hell that will come up against you. You know, David desired to build God a house. God said, no, you're a man of war. But because you desired to do it, I will give you credit for it. It's the worth of a wish. If a wish counts that much with God, how much more does a dream? Does a dream to be used powerfully and mindly of God? In fact, I would tell you, I don't know of very many people that have ever felt a call to ministry or desire to do something for God that they haven't in their night visions. God has not visited them in the midst of the night and caused them to dream about ministry. One of the most common things I hear from ministers who want to be used of God is, I dreamed I was standing in an arena or a field and there was a crowd of people around me. That dream is so common amongst ministers. It's so common that I have my own, I'm not a great interpreter of dreams, but I have my own take on that. My take on that is this. God is allowing you, God's fast forwarding into your future to allow you to see every person you could touch if you sell out to that dream that he is letting you stand at the judgment seat of Christ. He's fast forwarding to show you all of the people that will be influenced by your life. I just feel that in the Holy Ghost. And when I got up early this morning, was praying about today, I just shifted directions because I just felt like I was supposed to talk to you about something else today. I, I, uh, my text is a very familiar one. I, uh, Genesis 35, 37 and 5, and Joseph dreamed a, a dream. I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst of a book. I just got through with the first draft. I was editing it on the plane flying here. And I, I, it's called the point of low points. And I examine the five low points in the life of Joseph. It's going to be a small group curriculum. I'm really excited about it. But I've had Joseph on my mind a lot. In fact, but I've purposed in my heart that the whole time I'm writing, I would never preach about Joseph. And I've been very good at that until this morning. I just, the Lord just said, talk about Joseph. Joseph dreamed a dream. Eleven stars, sun, moon, bowing to his star. Sheaves of grain, bowing to him. Those dreams, they guided the young Joseph. Those dreams kept the middle-aged Joseph. 
Those dreams saw him through to the end of a 110-year lifespan. Those dreams, those dreams, if you can hold on to those dreams, those dreams will hold you in the middle of the will of God. Dreams do make a huge difference in your life. I stood in Orville Wright and Wilbur Wright's bicycle shop and uh, where they tinkered with those two-wheeled forms of conveyance. And, but they had a dream of something larger. They dreamed of flying. And even though their dad, a minister, said that if God wanted man to fly, he would have put wings on him. Uh, they had a dream of flying, and fly they did. I stood in the, young, in the workshop of the young Henry Ford. He dreamed of a horseless carriage, not for the rich man, but for the common man. Dreams direct our lives. They are the compasses for future endeavors. Yogi Berra once said, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. That's profound. It's just really profound. <laughs> but here, let, let, do this. If you would tell me your dream, I will write your life story in advance. Because it's only through a dream that the biography of your future begins to unfold. When you lay hold on that night vision and say, God, I'm going to see this. I'm going to bring it into the day. Who is the writer that said dreamers by day are dangerous people? Because they will make things come to life in their life. What do dreams do? They give you purpose in your life. They help you prioritize your life. Uh, I, I could talk about a lot of things here today, but here's what I, I want to go back to Genesis 37, 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, but that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the rest of the verse. And he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. The day I felt called to preach, I called my best friend. I thought he was my best friend. And I said, I've just got some news to share with you. God's called me to preach. And he started laughing at me. To this day, he's still laughing. He thinks I was the biggest fool on God's green earth to give up what I gave to start preaching the gospel. But folks... Let me just tell you, I, I didn't give up anything. This is the greatest life. The ministry is the greatest life. Uh, you, you, they're gonna, dreams are going to carry some hidden cost. You, you, you're, you're, uh, Joseph, you saw, you, saw, uh, you saw all sorts of beautiful things in your dreams, but you did not see the day that you were staggering and wandering in the field of Shechem when your dad told you to go there to find your brethren. But when the Father's word runs out, what do you do? Jews think that the man who met Joseph in the field at Shechem was a theophany. It was God in disguise. And it was God in disguise who said, Joseph, your future is not in Shechem, but it is in Dothan. You've got to go to Dothan. What are you going to find there? You're going to find that your brothers are jealous. You're going to find that your brother, one of them will say, let's kill him. The other one will say, no, let's sell him. You're going to find all sorts. You're going to be thrown into a pit at Dothan. Heaven knew what was waiting on Joseph. But, but heaven sent him there anyway. You see, you see one side of the dream. You don't see the hidden part of the dream. Dreams carry costs. And you've got to be willing to pay by day to see what God has given you in the night season. But I believe, I believe that when it's all said and done and you say, here's what I paid, it's going to be such a light affliction for the eternal weight of glory, that you're going to look at it and say it was nothing compared to the glory that I'm going to receive. Jacob, your dream at Bethel is coming with the price. Solomon, your dream at Gibeah is coming with the price. Uh, Joseph espoused to marry that dream. That dream that's about to come to life is going to cause you to be looked down upon. It's going to cause you to be rejected in society. You're going to live in a backwater village of Nazareth because of a 
dream because of accepting that dream into your life. I don't think we talk enough about the hidden cost of every dream, that for every effectual door of ministry, there are many adversaries. And if you faint when the day gets rough, if it starts getting a little tough and you say, you know, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I'm called out for this. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. When the going gets tough and you don't know what else to do, hold on to that dream. When the sermon bombs, when the doors don't open, you know, when the sermon, when the doors don't open, you know where I preach some of my first sermons? I preach them. We, we brought 2,000 kids to Sunday school every Sunday. Many of them were Spanish speaking. They couldn't speak English, so we had to act out everything. Uh, I, I did Balaam's donkey more than once. I did Jonah's whale many times. Uh, I usually was the donkey, and they loved me for the whale because I, I could barf real good when it came time to do that. And those were my, I, I, would, I would do the junior high class, and I, any door that was open for me, I looked at it like this is where God is wanting me to be. God is wanting to use me. It got to the place I did the adult Bible class. Uh, and when I got through with the adult Bible class, I started pulling my tie off because I was going to do kids' church next. Uh, and I, want, I just said, wherever you want to use me, God, if this door is closed, uh, God, there's a place for me to be used. Uh, if I'm not able to stand behind the pulpit on Sunday night or Sunday morning uh, in the main sanctuary, it's okay. I'll teach in children's church. I'll teach wherever you want me to teach. And, by, and I'll teach Bible studies. Uh, I'll go out and do whatever you want me to do because this dream is worth any price that I've got to buy the truth and sell it not. If you want this in your life, it's worth any price you've got to pay to see that dream come alive. Can you praise him right now? Just a moment. Hallelujah. 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 Calvary was a hidden part of Christ's dream. The Jews were looking for a Messiah and for a king. They were not looking for the suffering lamb. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The stripes on his back was for the dream of our healing. Yes, the angels appeared in the night sky singing glory to God in the highest. But what had been hidden even from the angels was how that glory and how that peace would come to this earth through the suffering and the rejection of the Messiah. You see, Calvary was a hidden part of every dream. There's got to be a death. Jesus so designed. Acts 20, 28, he said he, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, this church is built. There is no ministry built without shed blood. There is no church built without somebody dying to give birth to that church. That's how he ordained it. And so, you know, brothers and sisters, when it looks like your ministry is not going anywhere, find some place to pay a little of the, of the hidden cost of a dream and say, I'm going to dig it out over here. I'm going to do this. Pastor, what needs to be done around here? I want to be a district superintendent, presbyter. What do you need me to do? I don't need the limelight. Just let me find something. I'll never forget the day, the day that I told Brother Kilgore I was called to preach. He said, praise God, come here. I thought, man, he's going to give me a key to the church. <clears throat> There's no telling where he's taking me. He started walking down the hall out of his office. I was following him, and, and uh, we got to the intersection, the prayer room, and back toward the, the educational wing, and and uh, he turned away from the prayer room toward there. I said, well, I, I, we're not going to the prayer room. I was just marching and walking and marching and walking. And finally, we got to the end of the hall, and he pulls out his keys. And there was a closet door. I never knew what was behind that closet door. I thought, I'm about to be inducted into the inner sanctum. <laughs> I'm about to find out the secrets of what makes a great church right here. I stand a little taller, nod my head, and. 
about that time he opened the closet door and it was a broom closet he reached in grabbed a broom handed it to me and said go sweep off the front porches they're they're really dirty he said i'm so glad you're called to preach that's your job from now on i better never see a leaf better never see trash i want those front porches cleaned off real nice thank god for a good pastor that taught me that it's all about servanthood. Joseph didn't see that in his dreams. He saw them serving him. But he never knew how much service he would have to give before that day. Do you, do, can I fast forward in that dream? Do you remember when Joseph, Joseph was standing there and his ten brethren were in front of him? And uh, he looked at them and you, you follow this in the Bible and you think, what in the world is this all about? I mean, the Genesis, uh, 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 Joseph's story takes up 14 chapters. We've only got a single chapter on the creation of the world. I want to know about T-Rexes. I want to know about Ice Ages. And, uh, but we got 14 chapters on Joseph and one on creation. It's almost as if God would say, I want to show you how you cope with adversity in your life. And that's more important to me than all the details about how everything came into being. I want you to know how you're going to get through it. But he stood there looking at his ten brothers. And you remember what happened? He sent them away. Until they went and got Benjamin. You remember? He held Simeon until Benjamin came back. And then those eleven brothers stood before him and bowed. And then he couldn't hold back anymore. Because the dream had come true in his life. I, I want that dream to be totally completed in your life. I want you to serve and serve and serve and serve until you see exactly what God is going to do because hidden payments bring open rewards. What you're willing to receive in the darkness, God is going to make open in the light. What you're willing to get alone with God and wrestle down and say, I want to understand the mighty God in Christ, the new birth message. I want to understand a life of separation, the soon coming king. I want to get these doctrines. I want to learn them. I want to learn how to serve people. I want to learn how to serve my elders. I want to learn how to serve God with all of my heart. I want to do it all. I want to do it all. Everything that you do in private is going to be made public one of these days to some that's a curse but to those of us that are serious about loving God it's going to be a you will see that oh I feel a spirit of prophecy coming on me right now there's some of you that are going to live to see in this life those arenas filled with people uh, I, 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 I drove through Milwaukee coming out here and I saw this new stadium being built is there a new stadium I mean it just getting ready to open or something and uh, I saw this beautiful stadium stadium and I thought wouldn't it be wonderful Sunday if that stadium could be filled with tens of thousands of people and one of our preachers could be standing there preaching uh, and the mighty power of God being poured out if you've been dreaming it uh, you can receive it uh, if you continue to pay the price uh, in private there's going to come a day if you will abase yourself God will exalt you if you will build altars God will build your ministry if you'll spend your time on others uh, others it's going to come oh I feel the Holy Ghost in here right now Cast your bread on the water, and after many days it will return thence. Three interpretations of that scripture. One, one was that uh, at the, in the Nile River during flood stage, cast your bread, your bread corn upon the waters. Seed corn, bread corn. Seed is what, seed corn is what you sow. Bread corn is what you keep for the family to eat off of. But when you see the Nile enter into a flood stage and you see water, uh, water spread on ground that's never been irrigated, it's not time just to take the normal and the ordinary and cast the ordinary. It's time to reach into your sustenance, into your substance, into the bread corn, into the pantry, and pour everything you've 
got into it because you're about to see a harvest that you will never see in the rest of your lifetime. Here's what the Holy Ghost is saying. We are at flood stage, folks. This is not a time to say, I'm going to give the ministry three hours a day. I'm going to, I'm just going to make sure. I, I've got young ministers that when it comes time to put the shoulder to the wheel, they'll say, well, now wait a minute. We have a little family picnic plan. I believe in putting God first in our lives. I believe in keeping our marriage is strong. But can I tell you, the happiest families that I know in ministry are those that when there's work to be done, they roll up their sleeve and say, let's get after it. Let's make it happen. Let's do this. Uh, well, pastor, that's my Saturday. That's the only day I have off. I can't do anything on my Saturday. Well, guess what? That's the day that we do a lot of outreach. Uh, well, I don't want to do that. Well, it's okay, but the dream will never be fulfilled until you're paying that price, you're casting your bread on the water, and and after many days, it's coming back. There is a harvest. The second interpretation uh, is that in the, the olden days, they would make these tightly loaved, uh, uh, tightly baked loaves of bread. And if it had been a good harvest, uh, you walked out into the middle of the river with a basket of bread and you put the basket of the bread on the water of the river and say, thank you, God, for a great harvest, a wonderful harvest. I thank you, God. And you lifted up your hands and magnified God and that basket of bread just floated downstream. Uh, he said, that if you do that in the good times, in the lean times, uh, you can go back out to that river, lift up your hands and say, God, I bless you when times were good. I'll bless you now when times are bad. Uh, and pretty soon something's going to be bumping up against your leg. Uh, but you know what our problem is? We're so busy fixated uh, on where did it go downstream that we're not looking upstream and expecting the blessings of God coming our direction. The final interpretation that I've read of that scripture is that the Jews would send out the bread, corn, send out the grain to distant lands, and then ships bearing exotic spices and things would come from afar. One of the saddest things in life to watch are people standing on the dock waiting for their ship to come in when they never sent one out in the first place. It's your sacrifices that's going to bring that dream from afar. I'm almost through. Is this all right? Is this all right? I, 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 Peter, James, John, Luke, Mark, Jude, Bartholomew, Simon, James, Celeste, Philip, Andrew. When you heard Jesus say, follow me, did you really know what that was all about? Oh, Brother Gurley, don't talk like this. You might scare somebody out of the call of God. If I could, I would. But you know what? If there's a dream inside of you, I'm not going to scare it out. But you need to be clear-eyed about this thing. There's going to be a lot of sacrifice in the future, but it's worth it all. Disciples, did you know? Did you know? Did you know some of you will be crucified upside down? Some of you impaled and forgotten pagan countries. Some beheaded and skinned alive. Hey, let me talk to a modern world. Did you know you're going to be on the outs with the in crowd in the United States? Did you know you're going to be laughed and mocked and ridiculed by those who are liberated in our midst? Uh, I still say it's worth the price. It's worth the price. Uh, but oh, 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 if you live your dream, uh, hey, if you live your dream, uh, I just want to tell you, if you live your dream, uh, I see foundations with your name uh, in heavenly places. Uh, if you live your dream, there are going to be nations that turn to God. If you live your dream, uh, you're going to see it all happen. When Joseph weeped that day, he said, now I understand. What I didn't understand when I was a boy I understand as a man that those dreams were for a purpose. It wasn't about me at all, but it was about to save Israel, to save a nation, to save a world. But those dreams kept me from brethren's jealousy. Those dreams kept me when I was lied on. Those dreams kept me when I was forgotten. But now, when I see the dream's fulfillment, it's to save the 70 souls of Jacob that are getting ready to move into Egypt. Was it worth it? One soul is worth any price that we pay. Dr. Lyman Beecher, you may not recognize the name, Dr. Lyman Beecher, 
uh, each year at Yale University or the Lyman Beecher Lecture Series. They've gone on for nearly 200 years now. He was America's last Puritan. Uh, you'll know his kids. One of, his daughter, Harriet Beecher Stowe, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Abraham Lincoln said of Harriet Beecher Stowe, this is the woman who started the Civil War through one book that she wrote. Another one of Lyman Beecher's son was Henry Ward Beecher, America's first mega pastor. Uh, interesting, there's a book right now called The Most Famous Man in America. I'd recommend reading it. It talks about how Beecher sold out his Puritan heritage. Trace it through the sermons, how he sold out to build a church based on numbers and affluence. He pastored the famed Brooklyn Tabernacle. Abraham Lincoln said of him, he was the most famous man in America in Lincoln's day. When Lyman Beecher was dying, someone drew near to Lyman Beecher and said, Doctor, you know great things. You know great theology. Would you tell us what is the greatest thing? He lifted up out of that deathbed and said, It's not theology and it's not controversy, but the greatest thing is is to win souls. I want to win souls. That's what the dream was about. It was all about souls. I feel the wonderful presence of the Lord in this room right now. I, I just feel like God is doing something in our midst and that we're seeing generate. I just heard, you may have heard it, 300 and something received the Holy Ghost just a week or so ago in Stockton, California. Do you know that Frank Barlaman, who wrote the Azusa Street papers and the books about Azusa Street, said, the most I ever saw the, receive the Holy Ghost at one time was 164 people. The Holy Ghost is moving in our day. Don't get weary. Hold on. It was in that book, the 400-year-old book, Bunyan, created some more memorable characters on the route to Celestial City. One man who fought a good fight and received the summons to pass over the chilly waters of death into that city. His name was Mr. Valiant for Truth. When the word came, he called for his friends and told them of it. He said, I'm going to my father's house. And though with great difficulty I have got hither, I do not now repent of all the trouble I've been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage. My courage and my skill I give to the one who can get it. But my marks and my scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. Your marks and your scars and you're paying the price there is a crown that's awaiting every one of you. You know, when I do a study of the crowns in the New Testament, I find seven different crowns. Do you know that one of them is the soul winner's crown? Do you know that one of them is the shepherd's crown? Do you know that you are going to be crowned so that you can do something that others can't do? Because when Jesus appears uh, on that great white horse, he is crowned with many crowns. Uh, it's going to be me and you that have the privilege uh, of taking the crowns he puts on our heads uh, and turning around and crowning him in return. Because this is all about him. This is all about him, what we're doing. I feel the Holy Ghost. Could you, could you right where you're at? Uh, why, why don't we stand just a moment? And I, I don't know how Brother Soto is going to close this out, but I feel the presence of the Lord in here. And if you're standing next to your spouse, this is precious. And if you've got your uh, a child or two beside you, and or if you have if you have some family members beside you, I wish you would draw close to them right now. Put your arms around shoulders. If you're alone, would you adopt yourself into a family right now? I want uh, nobody standing alone. I feel the presence of the Lord here. It's going to be worth every long mile. Your labors are not in vain. There's going to be discouragement, but don't you ever throw 
in the towel. And don't you ever abandon that dream that God has given to you. You can leave the land of familiar and go to the land of the dreams. Uh, you can leave the land of the common and move into miracle country. I feel the Holy Ghost uh, in this place right now. I wish you would just lay hands on your your relatives right now, your loved ones, your friends, uh, and begin and begin to speak words uh, in faith right now and say it will not always be the way that it has always been. Uh, life will not go on the way it has always gone. Uh, but there is a vista of opportunity around me right now. There is a place opening up around me. Uh, it's not out there. It's not in some distant place. Uh, but right now I'm confronted with an opportunity uh, to lift up my pastor's hands, uh, to lift up the hands of the ministers around me. Uh, I rebuke the devourer. I rebuke the discourager. I rebuke the one that would tempt us to come down off of our wall. Uh, I rebuke it in the name of the Lord. Uh, there is a great hope and there is a great high calling uh, in this room. Uh, oh, let the dream be realized. Uh, let the dream be realized in this place right now, God. Uh, I pray your blessings. Uh, I pray your anointing. Uh, I pray your great grace. Uh, I pray your holy power. I pray for an unction from on high. Uh, I pray for new strength. Uh, I pray for encouragement, God. Uh, I pray, Lord. Uh, I pray for a vision uh, that will not let us rest. Uh, a burden that will not let us grow complacent, God. Uh, but a passion, God, uh, that will enthuse and infuse us, God. Uh, that we would reach our world, God. That we would be used mightily of you. Uh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, I praise you, O oh Lord. I praise you, O oh Lord. I bless you, O oh Lord. Oh, he's here in this building right now. I feel him. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. I praise you, God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Oh, hallelujah. I was seated at banquet tables with about a 500 other people, a church in our area that was celebrating its 80th anniversary. And I told a story of how Seymour got up at the close of Azusa revival, that 1,000-day revival. And William Seymour prophesied that in 100 years there would come a revival that would make Azusa pale in comparison. Then I told the story of Brother Cher when he was a young man who came to Houston a century ago, and he saw angels coming out of the night sky, and he saw jewels dropping out of their hands, and every place a jewel hit planet Earth, fires exploded, and he saw a revival spread across the world. And then I told the vision of Brother Barnes, the late Brother Barnes, who saw a similar thing, an angel coming out of the sky with gifts and presents falling, and every place they landed in the United States, revival began to be born. And he saw this in light of the coming king, that Jesus was coming back. I was telling these stories to the banquet, and there was a lot of noise and a lot of clanking of silverware and crystal. And when one of the young ministers of the church cried out, it was a wail. Oh, everything got quiet. When I opened my eyes, I, there was just a roar of prayer in that room. People had dropped their forks and fallen down on the floor. It was like a, a sickle had gone through that building, and people just fell out on the floor. I perceived that something, something was happening that I didn't understand what was going on, and later I found out 
But that young minister had had a vision. He had had a vision that he and the pastoral team were walking through a Bill walking through a field toward a large barn and what drew them toward the barn is there were spokes of light radiating out from the cracks of the timber in that barn. And they got to the big doors on that barn and they opened of their own accord and brilliant light ushered out of the barn. And they saw a massive angel standing there. They drew close to the angel and the angel had a gift in his hands. And as they drew close, the angel stooped down to them. And as they reached out for the gift, the angel disappeared. And the walls fell away from that barn. And they looked to the east, west, north, and south. And there were teams, hundreds, thousands of people coming toward that barn. Oh, my, my, my. Do you know since that vision took place a year and a half ago, They have not failed to stop baptizing people. They just built a brand new church, and that that church has outgrown itself now. They have prayed through hundreds of people. The ministry team, it's all young ministers doing this. God is doing a great work. You know what I feel? If there is a gift on heaven's shelves that has my name on it, I want to make sure that I've got my hands like this and not doing this right here. Oh, my. Would you just reach up all over this room right now? God, don't let that gift lay unclaimed on heaven's shelf. Uh, If the ones I'm speaking to right now could usher in a revival. uh, Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel a christening spirit in this room right now. I feel a mantle of authority dropping in this room. Uh, Oh, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Uh, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Minister, would you turn around to another minister right now? Just lay hands on them. Sister, would you turn around to a woman right now and find, I feel the Holy Ghost uh, saying it's time to receive that gift. Uh, It's time to begin to open that gift. Uh, It may come with some assembly required. Uh, It may include a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, There may be a Gethsemane or a Calvary or two, uh, but the hidden cost is worth the open reward oh hallelujah hallelujah oh hallelujah 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 oh I receive it Lord I receive it God I pull down the barricades. I pull down the excuses. I pull down everything, every high thought, every imagination that exalts itself against you, Lord. Uh, oh, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Uh,